live rounds were shot and uh, security forces, as they have been in past weeks, uh, were trying to break up the protest using um, brutal violence, essentially, against the pro these protesters. We don't know the actual, I don't, I can't confirm the actual number of deaths, but uh, with live rounds and with the blueprint that they've used in the past and they've used in the in recent weeks, it seems to be going down the same um, method of, of brutal violence to crack down on these protesters using any means. I'm joined now by Nagar Murtazavi, who's an Iranian-American journalist, political analyst and host of the Iran podcast. Good evening to you, Nagar. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Really good to have you with us tonight. Um, the scenes that we're seeing uh, on social media and so on appear to show literally thousands of protesters defying the Iranian police and the authorities um, to mark the, the 40 days after the death of Masa Amini. Indeed, we the local media have reported at least 10,000 and we see images of this sea of people walking down the road. The actual number could be even higher. And the 40th um, day after the death is a very significant day in the cycle of mourning for Iranians, the seventh day and then the 40th of day. And it also, um, I've seen people draw in comparison to the 1979 revolution and those cycles of protest back then where people would protest and then 40 days later come back to mourn the death of some protesters. Some new protesters would be killed and then 40 days later there would be another cycle of protests. And it seems like this one is starting to look like that as some protesters protesters were killed today, live rounds were, were shot at them, and then 40 days from today, it will be the 40th day of mourning for the ones who were killed today. Yeah, I mean, we're hearing reports that uh, Iranian police eventually opened fire on protesters and uh, that a number of other demonstrators were killed uh, as the police sought to break up the demonstration. That's correct. We're hearing human rights organizations and some eyewitnesses who I also saw in the reports have talked to the BBC and other outlets saying that live rounds were shot and uh, security forces, as they have been in past weeks, uh, were trying to break up the protest using um, brutal violence, essentially, against the pro these protesters. We don't know the actual, I don't, I can't confirm the actual number of deaths, but uh, with live rounds and with the blueprint that they've used in the past and they've used in the in recent weeks, it seems to be going down the same um, method of, of brutal violence to crack down on these protesters using any means. And uh, it seems that quite a number were also rounded up and arrested. Indeed. So um, some human rights organizations are reporting over 200 protesters at least over 200 protesters killed in the past few weeks in protests, including dozens of children, school children, and uh, thousands have been arrested, including many today in the past in 2009, in 2019, also mass protests. Many of those who were arrested were handed a very harsh sentences. So we seem to be seeing the same blueprint. Also, journalists are putting under pressure and threat political activists. A few dozen journalists have been arrested. Those who are still out in the country are under fear, under threat, and they get, um, they're essentially unnoticed from security forces and foreign journalists also have limited mobility and how much they can cover and permission on how much they can cover these protests. What is extraordinary is that um, despite the risk of arrest, uh, of being locked up for some considerable time and even um, of death or injury, none of the attempts to clamp down on these protests seems to be succeeding in stopping them. Incredible. We're seeing incredible and very um, brave, essentially, scenes of bravery and courage by women, by young girls, school children, women and allies, I must say, and an intersectional community of protesters. We had university students joining in, the teachers joined in, now doctors 
and medical personnel are joining in, essentially protesting the way these protesters are being t uh, treated health-wise. From a safety and health-wise, we had lawyers join in and oil workers joining with strikes. Also, the ethnic communities, the Kurdish community, the Baluchi community, different pockets and different sections of protests um, and posing a serious legitimacy crisis to the, to the regime and the entirety of the Islamic Republic. Just explain a bit more about what lies behind these demonstrations. Um, clearly, they were triggered by the death of Masa Amini, but they, but her death was part of the demonstrations against the very strict de dress code and other restrictions that there are on women in Iran. Indeed, the spark was the death in custody of the police of a 22-year-old Kurdish girl, Gina Masa Amini, but. It's essentially, it's followed by a feminist revolution or a feminist uprising of women, girls, and allies against decades of discrimination, and not just in the form of a dress code and this violent enforcement of the mandatory hijab, but also in marriage law, in divorce, in child custody, inheritance, even traveling as a professional woman. If you want to travel outside the country, you need permission from your husband. So discrimination and state-sanctioned violence against women to enforce these discriminatory laws. And then an intersectional, as I said, community of protesters each bringing their own grievances with that, with a lot of overlap against the regime, with political grievances, economic grievances, social, cultural, and essentially, um, in a way, forming a, a unified body against and chanting against the entirety of the Islamic Republic, the corrupt political elite that they see responsible for the current situation in that, from an economic viewpoint, political and social. Uh, Iran, of course, uh, has um, pretty much a lack of relations with countries like the United States, Britain, most of the rest of Europe. But would you like to see uh, the West doing more to put direct pressure on the Iranian authorities to um, perhaps uh, to change their approach to these demonstrations, perhaps be prepared to listen or even to adapt the laws and the repression which lie behind them? Well, we see activists calling for what they call human rights uh, sanctions or designations, which I've seen the United States just today. They issued a fresh batch of designations of about 14 individuals and three entities who are involved in the repression and the violence and also the surveillance and censorship. Because another element of this repression is the limiting of access to the internet and social media networks in order to prevent protesters from communicating and organizing and mobilizing. So these designations of the human rights abusers and those who are involved in this repression and surveillance against people is something that have been welcomed by activists, human rights activists, women's rights activists. The U.S. also issued um, uh, exemptions from technology sanctions so that uh, technology companies can provide applications and services to Iranian users. That was welcomed by internet freedom activists. As far as how much more the West can do, they have, the Western countries have limited power. They can put some diplomatic pressure on Iran in the international stage. In and the I'm human afraid we're going to have to leave it there. I'm so sorry. Really good to speak to you. Nagar Murtasavi, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Times Radio.